of drawings or whatever. And we get to a point where we will say to people, well, there's two things we can start to think about now. One is the pain of protection, having thought about how we're going to make the thing and the sort of process to do it, and whether we're sort of getting vaguely close to the mark. Uh, and the fact that we're going to have to go and uh, talk to people elsewhere, that is, uh, injection moulders, uh, uh, metal processors, etc. So we can no longer control the information. Um, things are likely to get out. So at that point, there's two different things you need to think about as a patent and uh, the question of, uh, of securing the people that you do have to deal with so that we try and keep the information confidential. There are some products where confidentiality is not a big issue. There are others where it's much more important. But the uh, issue of an agreement is one of basically reminding the guy who's quoting tooling and on part manufacture, etc., uh, reminding them of the fact that this is information that needs to be kept secure. This is information that you don't discuss with a whole pile of your second best friend or anyone else. This is information that you don't leave lying on your desk. So every other odd bod that wanders into your office can sort of just look at it for something to do. We've had some clients who went what you would call overboard in trying to cover their ass. And instead of presenting a short, simple agreement, they presented the sort of umpteen page fine print deal covering every possibility but, you know, losing the kitchen sink. And it's this sort of thing that presents a bit of a problem because uh, when people uh, in this situation uh, and others similar have gone to uh, souls to say, well, look, George, uh, Nell, sign this and we'll get away. And they look at, take one look at it and think, my God, you know, what are we committing to here? This all looks pretty complicated. I think this needs to go to our lawyer. Now, as soon as that happens, then life gets complicated because, you know, then, then their lawyer look, comes back and justifies the fee by suggesting this, that, and 15 other things and and then it goes back to your lawyer and then backwards and forwards and it costs a fortune and the whole thing it just winds up a great fangdango. The, the realities of life are you can never cover everything. So um, in this situation we found the most practical, sensible way of approaching things is to have more or less a one-page agreement. One page for psychological reasons, that is, not spread to two and sometimes in big print, but basically the equivalent, if it's, if, ideally if it's one page, it's great because then people don't perceive that it's all too involved. And essentially you're defining uh, who you are and what your idea is and, and um, the fact that it needs to be kept secure and, and uh, the fact that you don't want people obviously copying it. But uh, it's short and sweet. Uh, with the idea of covering the main issues. Uh, as soon as it gets uh, into a, a, a sort of cover every situation scenario, it gets to a point where people simply don't want to know about. So uh, my suggestion is usually to people to say, now look, uh, we'll have one page here, we can give you a template. Uh, you can go to your uh, patent attorney or even a lawyer, but normally patent attorneys often have this, and you can get, they'll give you a template. We don't offer any guarantees to anybody, in fact we wash our hands of all that legality. Uh, we're just sort of trying to present the issue as a sort of common sense thing, is to say, well if you want people to quote, don't tie them up in knots, mate, because it's not going to happen. They wouldn't know about it. <coughs> Realise you're not going to cover everything. Realise the key issues of what you do want to cover. Uh, if it's the whole issue is that touchy, then you best have your uh, patent uh, sort of uh, in the pipeline prior to doing this. But we're always reluctant to get people to dive too early into the patent process, just in case you, you've got to toss the whole show away and start again when you find that you've effectively uh, haven't covered the uh, what we call the low-cost option. 
a practical low cost option. Um, no good covering the $200 can opener when, you know, really it's a $2 one you've got to focus on. In terms of a patent or, or registered design, some things suit a registered design, nowhere near as expensive, relatively cheap in comparison, but it covers the shape of things. And uh, in some cases, uh, it, it has extreme limitation, but others, it, it, it does work. We've had cases where clients have, have done extremely well with that. So, uh, main point about a pain is don't rush and don't get out of bed one morning and suddenly decide that you've got to hurtle down to the nearest uh, patent uh, guy and, and sort of lodge a patent for you know the thing that you had in your mind at, at sort of one o'clock in the morning um, because if you're really going to get a, a decent sort of paint you need to be protecting uh, a practical item not some thing that, that uh, no one ever make like that in a pink fit. Um, you need to be protecting the inverted commas low cost solution, not the um, super exotic number that no one would ever make. Uh, and too often we've had people where they had to really start the whole process again because they had a concept which was really not manufacturable in the first place. And then when we sort of got to the point of sorting out something that was in the real life world manufacturable, um, it, it wound up fairly different. And so the whole process had to be started again at great expense to everybody. So that is pretty important to take on board. Uh, you try and do it in a measured way. And uh, secondly, uh, we like to make sure that the preparatory work that we've done as the drawings and details and plans and prototypes and whatever, are all presented to the patent attorney so that they're in the best possible position to grasp what the damn thing's all about. Because they're the ones that are going to have to sort of, and also give them sufficient background. So they're in a good position to write a, write a document and in a good position to try and uh, uh, lay out the claims that are being made here and the key issues that are relevant in your particular case. Uh, and try and get some, some sort of protection on those key issues. Um, this is uh, quite an important process and too often it's done poorly and too often the attorney doesn't know enough about the subject or well, so when they walk in the office probably don't know anything about it but um, you don't provide them with enough data uh, to get their head around uh, what the thing's about and what the key issues are about. So too often that's the client's problem and not the attorney's problem. Uh, so normally what happens, we'll advise people to say, you know, here's a firm you can go to that we believe is, is uh, quite reasonable and does a decent job. And then of course there's the particular attorney and the pluses and minuses of, of the individual concern. So um, <clears throat> this gives you a good start in, in the whole matter. Bear in mind there is an effective strategy, um, which we won't go into here, for trying to cover a patent issue properly, uh, properly in the sense of in a, in a practical way should people try and get at it. Um, and too many, too many patents are too easily got at because, as I've mentioned before, they haven't been framed properly. So there is a strategy to go there and there's also a strategy as to where you patent and where you don't bother. And, uh, and uh, also I should mention above and beyond everything else in the fullness of time as a result of extensive experience in this uh, we see a patent as design and whatever as a marketing tool. Now you say oh marketing tool, golly gee. Well, the reality is, <coughs> is, that, is that you're trying to discourage the purpose of this whole business is to discourage people from having a go at you, from, to discourage people from copying. If someone, say for example tomorrow, came to us and said, we have perceived a market that we think is very interesting, there are a number of patents or one or two or whatever, applicable in this area, how can you effectively get around that? Well, guess what? There's usually always some way around the problem. Too often people have protected the 
inverted commas, $200 can opener and not the $2 one. Uh, too often they've given out heaps of useful information, but they haven't looked at it from a point of, of uh, is this an item, have they, protect, pre have they protected the most the most cost efficient way of, of uh, product. Uh, are there ways of doing the same thing far better that don't tread on their inverted commas claims? So bear that in mind. Number one is, is, is that it is a useful marketing tool later on down the track when you come to try and sell your product or your company. Uh, secondly, it's a useful thing to um, to use uh, to just discourage others from bothering to try. Should they seriously bother to try, then the issue becomes, have you protected the most cost efficient outcome? So um, we'll, we'll leave that subject at that and, uh, and uh, elsewhere we'll put up another video on distribution agreements. Um, the issue uh, of trademarks, business uh, names, um, uh, logos, etc. We, we go through these with people and try and sort them out. One of the key bits of advice we give people is that be very, very careful. It's the old story. Start with the end in mind. Be very conscious of getting it right as best you can at the beginning. Because if you have to change things later on down the track, it gets very messy. Give you an example. You, you file a uh, trade name, business name, logo, whatever here, uh, in, in this country. And then you go to another country and you find that um, it's not registrable. That's right. Uh, if, for example, you go to the US, you'll find that uh, registering names is not that simple. They uh, don't give you too much latitude. There are a hell of a lot of things that are just simply not acceptable. And this can make it quite hard. So it's a good idea first to work out something that passes the tests of can you register this thing in Europe, European Union, can you do it in the United States, uh, before elsewhere, uh, otherwise uh, so that when it comes to the crunch, hopefully you've got a chance of getting this thing through. If you wind up having to have another brand name, logo, etc., in another one of those uh, major areas, you may wind up having to have change the whole thing. And then suddenly you've got uh, two different uh, types of packaging. You've got to have, uh, all your text got to change. Uh, in terms to accommodate a new brand name, uh, the whole thing get to be an absolute nightmare. So uh, check first. Be very conscious of of doing the homework before you uh, firm up the name in your own marketplace. Because if the product's any good, you'll want to go to where the uh, the most exposure is. So um, that's just the sort of short bit on, on uh, brand names, logos, etc. Thank you very much. I hope that's helpful.